Belton is a suburban community south of Kansas City, approximately 25,000 people. It's not a typical suburb even though it is part of the Kansas City metropolitan area. It's a working class town, it's a suburb of Kansas City. People there, they go to work, they come home, they love on their family. Kara Kopetsky didn't come home from school one evening. Kara Kopetsky was 17 years old when she was last seen on May 4, 2007. She was caught on surveillance footage asking a friend to skip class with her before she left Belton High School alone at 9.19 a.m. At 9.20 a.m., she received a final call from her ex-boyfriend Kyler Yust. Kara and Kyler had a rocky relationship that ended in April 2007 when she broke things off. She filed a restraining order against Kyler after accusing him of kidnapping, restraining, and choking her. He supposedly held a knife to her throat and threatened to kill her. In her protection order request she wrote that she was unsure of what Yust will do next because the abuse has gotten worse over time. A judge granted her protection order and an officer attempted to serve Kyler on May 3, 2007 with a trial date set for May 10, but Kara would never be heard from again. Kara had been known to be ornery at times, but this was not something that was within her character. Every indication is that she was a very caring, very friendly teenager that would pretty much do anything for anyone. Kara, that morning, was seen talking to some of her friends and saying, hey, should we skip school? So it is known from surveillance footage that she left Belton High School at 9.21 in the morning. But no one knows exactly who she left Belton High School with. Kara's family knew that she had a restraining order out against an ex-boyfriend, and that boyfriend had assaulted her a couple of days before. On April 28, Kyler Yust went by Kara's workplace about the time she was getting off work. Convinced her to get into his truck. There were some reports of a physical altercation between Kyler and Kara. He eventually dropped her off in a parking lot and drove away, leaving her alone. It was just a day later that Kara Kopetsky and her mother filed a restraining order. Kyler Yust had several run-ins with the law. He grew up south of Kansas City, and people described Kyler as super charming, but friends said that he had a dark side. The fact that Kyler had exhibited violent tendencies toward Kara within the few days leading up to her disappearance was the original reason to look at him. There are phone records that Kara was texting with Kyler just the same day that she went missing from Belton High School. Police finally interviewed Kyler on May 6, 2007. Kyler had an alibi. It was that he was with his great aunt at a nursing home in Kansas City. But police never followed up on this alibi. There was no interview with staff members at that nursing home to prove that Kyler Yust was there. They could not make that final leap there to connect him to Kara's disappearance on that afternoon. On May 9th, which would have been five days after she disappeared, her paycheck at work became available, and she could have picked it up and she would have picked it up, but she never did. As the years continued to roll on, this case would tend to fade into the background of a community, like it never happened here. There was no one in Cass County who didn't know Kara's face, almost as intimately as if she was their own child. And the years dragged on, it became an unspoken thought that they may never know what happened to her. The Belton community is walking to remind people about Kara's disappearance. Her family, still looking for closure and clues. Somebody knows something. An attendant at a local convenience store told officers at the time that, yes, he saw them together at 11 o'clock, 11.30 that morning. There was a problem with follow-up on getting the surveillance tape from that store. And they also failed to follow up with that particular employee and lost track of him. Would the videotape have actually shown Kyler and Kara together? They will never know. 
Kyler never gave police any indication that he was involved in her disappearance in any way. The investigators did have testimony from multiple individuals that Kyler had admitted to them one-on-one -on -one that he had killed before and that he could do it again. In 2011, the FBI had Caitlin Ferris go undercover. Caitlin picked him up in the car and talked about their pasts a little bit. They had been romantically involved for a while. Kyler had some interest in being romantically involved with her again. She kind of played him along. She started showing interest in the Karakopetsky case, and that she'd like to do a seance with him and see if they could communicate with her. She tried to get him to admit that he had killed her and where he had taken the body, but he never quite went lying and gave them the smoking gun that they needed to make an arrest. But he sure didn't do anything in that period of time to eliminate himself as the killer. Oh my god. Just like, felt her hand on my shoulder and I heard like, she didn't say anything, it was just like her voice. Like she just like, like, ah. Uh, just like or something like she just said like just made the noise it was her voice i promise i will come back and see you Carla. because i killed her and left her out in the wilderness alone but if her spirit just won the voice this really turns you on that i killed a girl it doesn't really turn me on yeah well you're saying all that bullshit there yeah. just because you're trying to get me to confess no yeah no eventually Kyler Yust was jailed on a drug charge and sent to prison. That time, law enforcement attempted to interview him in prison. They could not get him to say anything that would indicate he had any involvement with the case whatsoever. There's been another girl disappear and she was with Kyler. Jessica Runyons was 21 years old. She was from Raymore, Missouri, which is actually just south of Belton, where Kara Kopetsky was from. Her parents described her as incredibly fun-loving. She loved her family, her friends loved her. She's super sweet has such a kind heart. I mean, she works at a retirement home, and so she was a server there. She got moved up to a cook. Kyler and Jessica were last seen at a party at a friend's house and they had gotten into a vehicle and left. On September 10, Jamie Runyons contacted Raymore police and reported her daughter Jessica missing, and she later discovered that no one had had any contact with Jessica since the party. That set off the search for Jessica Runyons. Police spent hours at the duplex where Jessica attended the party on Thursday night. Another person attending that party, Kyler Yust. Jessica left a gathering of friends on September 8, and hasn't been heard from since. She was supposed to text the party host when she got home, but no text was ever sent. It was a few hours later on the morning of September 9th that her Chevy Equinox is found burning. Jessica's car was discovered on fire on Blue River Road, which is an isolated location in South Kansas City, Missouri. Later that same night, Kyler and his half-brother, Jessup Carter were pulled over by officers. There was some interaction at that point with Jessup Carter and his wife who was in the front seat, and with Kyler Yust who was in the back. The officer testified that Kyler Yust was incredibly nervous, and that Jessup Carter's wife had a gun. They confiscated the gun, but they let all three of them go. And then, they traveled back to Jessup's hometown of Edwards, Missouri, it's a couple hours south of Kansas City, and they dropped Kyler off at a trailer. There's a lot of mystery about what happened between Jessup Carter and Kyler Yust in the early morning hours after Jessica went missing. Eventually, Jessup reported to law enforcement that Kyler had killed Jessica Runyons and disposed of her body and that he had helped burn her car and told police where they could find him. Police actually went, arrested Kyler there and they took him back to jail. They weren't able to arrest him in direct connection with Jessica's disappearance, but they were able to charge him with knowingly burning her car. And they set the bond so high that he couldn't get out. 
Police found him with burns all over his face, hands, and arms and apparent scratches on his face. I have no idea, sir. What happened to your face? Did you get burned? What happened to your face? Did you kill Jessica? Did you? He pled not guilty to the charge of knowingly burning a vehicle. Over the years since Kara's disappearance, officers heard at least nine different stories of Kyler admitting to the murders of Kara and Jessica from various people in his life. In many interviews they claimed that Kyler had admitted to strangling both girls. On April 3, 2017 a set of remains was discovered by a mushroom hunter. During a search the next day, officers found a second set of remains in the same area. On April 5, the first set of remains were identified as Jessica, and in August the second set was identified as Kara's. Kyler has been formally charged in the murders of Kara Kopetsky and Jessica Runyons with two counts of murder and two counts of abandoning a corpse. He pled not guilty to these charges. His trial is set for November 2019. In April of 2021, a jury found Kyler just guilty of voluntary manslaughter for Kopetsky's death and second-degree murder for Runyons's death. Judge William Collins decided to adopt the juror's recommendation that Yust receive maximum sentences for both convictions. That means life in prison for second-degree murder, and 15 years for voluntary manslaughter. In Missouri, because life sentences are capped at 30 years, the sentences will run consecutively for a total of 45 years in prison. The bodies of Yust's two victims were found together in a wooded area in Cass County in 2017. Witnesses said Jessica Runyons was last seen leaving a party with Yust in 2016. She was 21 years old at the time. Kara Kopetsky was 17 years old when last seen leaving Belton High School in 2007. The prosecution argued during Yust's trial that he was a jealous boyfriend who could not tolerate either woman becoming involved with another man. The defense pointed to the lack of physical evidence in the prosecution's case. There was no DNA evidence linking Yust to either woman's death. Yust took the witness stand in his own defense during his trial and blamed his half-brother, Jessup Carter, for the killings. Carter took his own life in 2018 in the Jackson County Jail.